Today on People Now, condolences pouring in for Dwayne Johnson after news of his father, professional wrestler Rocky Johnson's death. Prince Harry all smiles at his first Palace event appearance since stepping down as a senior royal. Oprah Winfrey opens up about her spiritual partnership with Stedman Graham and how they've made it work for so many years. I'm cooking almost every single meal. Kristen Cavallari getting real about her family life on the farm and Very Cavallari season three. Sir, you wanted to see us. We're going on a little field trip. Neil McDonough and Aiden Gillen are here with all we need to know about Project Blue Book season two. That and so much more live today on People Now. Let's go. Hey everyone, happy Thursday. Welcome to People Now. Great to see you. A lot to get to today, including Oprah Winfrey. She's opening up about her spiritual partnership with Stedman Graham. It's a new interview. We've got all the details a little later on. But first, this got us thinking about what you think is the most important aspect of a relationship. Is it that spiritual connection? You might think trust is the most important, physical attraction, or maybe a solid sense of humor. Vote in our People poll. Let us know your thoughts using the hashtag People Now. That's a tough one. What I mean, all think? those are important things. You have a successful relationship, so... I think, I I mean, the, the physical attraction is obviously the initial Yeah, but thing. that's not... No, that's the initial piece. Yeah. Usually. And then you build from there. Anyway, a lot to discuss. I think trust <laughs> is probably the number one. Trust is but definitely important. But they have to be That's built. That's a humor. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> <sighs> We're going to check in on that a little later for now. Here's what you need to know and what's trending today. Kate Middleton revealed on Wednesday that her family might be complete while chatting with fans in Bradford, Yorkshire. One fan excitedly revealed that he had sent cards congratulating her after each of her three children were born, to which she said, quote, I don't think William wants any more. William and Kate share sons Prince George and Prince Louis and daughter Princess Charlotte. Kate hinted at the idea of expanding her family last February when she met an adorable baby in Northern Ireland and admitted to feeling, quote, broody. During the duo's outing on Wednesday, Kate couldn't help but rave over a proud mom moment that she had with Louis. One fan told People that the Duchess said Louis is balancing now, and Kate apparently told her that it was, quote, really nice to see him turning into a little boy. Very sweet. This is the first outing for William and Kate since news broke that Meghan Markle and Prince Harry will be stepping back as senior members of the royal family. The royals appear to be in good spirits despite Harry and Meghan's shocking exit, with a crowd member saying William didn't let it show that the drama had been going on. Prince Harry is keeping his sense of humor amid the ongoing turmoil in the royal family. He was asked about his future at his first palace appearance on Thursday since his royal exit, and sources tell people that he didn't answer, but he laughed at the attempt to get his opinion on what's going on behind the scenes since he and Meghan announced that they are stepping down as senior royals. Harry was at Buckingham Palace in London on Thursday to host the Rugby League World Cup 2021 draws for the men's, women's, and uh, wheelchair tournaments. A lot going on there. At the event, Harry talked about the importance of sports in his life from his younger years to the Invictus game, explaining that the impact of sports on individuals and the community is, quote, remarkable. He also took advantage of the occasion to also show his support for a new mental health initiative created by England's Rugby Football League. Watch this. Rugby League isn't just a sport. It's a community and one that takes care of its own. For many years, it has been at the forefront of promoting and supporting good mental fitness, working hard to build a positive mindset for everyone involved in the sport. So I am proud to support the Rugby League World Cup 2021 Mental Fitness Charter. Sounds like a really great initiative. Harry was announced as patron of the Rugby Football League in December 2016, succeeding his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, who held the role for 64 years. All right, sad news today. Dwayne Johnson's father and Canadian professional wrestler Rocky Johnson has died. The WWE confirmed the news on Wednesday night. He was 75 years old and his cause of death is not currently known. Rocky was born in Nova Scotia and began wrestling at the age of 16. He joined the WWE in 1983 and was also a former world tag team champion in the WWE. Rocky was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2008. He retired back in 1991, but went on to train his son, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and in 2018, Dwayne thanked his father for making him who he is today. And for Dwayne's first acting job, he actually portrayed his father. That was in a 1999 episode of that 70s show. It was titled That Wrestling Show. Since the news broke, many fans and WWE stars have shared messages in tribute on their social media. Booker T. Huffman, a fellow WWE Hall of Famer, wrote in part on Twitter, one of the men that I looked up to and one of the best to ever do it. God rest his soul. Another WWE Hall of Famer, Mick Foley, tweeted in part, I'm so sorry to hear of the passing of the great Rocky Johnson. Always a gentleman. I always enjoy talking with him. Meanwhile, current WWE star Dana Brooke wrote on Twitter, my heart goes out to the family of The Rock and may prayers be sent your way during this time. I'm sorry for your loss. 
course, our condolences go out to the family as well. Let's move on to this. Broadcaster Sandy Toxvig has announced that she'll be leaving her hosting gig on the popular reality cooking show, The Great British Bake Off. The comedian revealed the news of her departure on Thursday in a statement on Twitter. In Toxvig's statement, she said that she would be moving on from the program to focus on other work projects, saying in part, when stepping down from a job, it's quite common for people to say that they are doing so in order to spend more time with their family. Unusually, I'm departing from the Great British Bake Off so I can spend more time with my other work. Then joking, Toxvig says, as my waistline will testify, Bake Off is an all-consuming show. Spending time with Prue, Paul, and Noel has been one of the great pleasures of my life. These are friendships which I know will continue beyond the confines of television. That was her quote. Toxvig hosted The Great British Bake Off since 2017 alongside fellow comedian Noel Fielding. The two are joined on the show by judges Paul Hollywood and Prue Leith. Now, this isn't the first time The Great British Bake Off has seen a change. The show, which has aired for 10 seasons, was originally presented by Sue Perkins and Mel Gidroyce with Hollywood joined by Judge Mary Berry. Perkins, Gidroyce, and Berry all left the show in 2016 during a network shift in the UK, and fans know about that. The Great British Bake Off has become a crossover success. American audiences have fallen in love with the series thanks to repeat airings on PBS and Netflix. And Andrea, you have more for us today in Star Trek. Yes, I do. We are kicking off Star Trek today with one celebrity who is ready to join the Beehive. Take a look. I got hot sauce in my face. What? Woo! <laughs> Welcome to the Beehive, Reese Witherspoon. On Wednesday, Reese shared a video of herself unpacking her latest gift from musical icon Beyonce. Maybe you've heard of her. In the video, Reese and her mom attempt to open a large orange box, and inside there are pieces from Beyonce's Ivy Park collaboration with Adidas. That is a huge box. At the start of the video, Reese says to the camera, You guys, someone told me that a big package is arriving. Let's go see. The actress then excitedly pushes the orange box on wheels up her driveway before giving her Instagram followers a mini fashion show sporting some of the items from the new clothing line while Beyonce's song Formation plays in the background. Reese captioned the minute-long Instagram video with, does this officially make me the newest member of the Beehive? I would say it does. The unisex <laughs> Ivy Park collection is set to launch on Saturday. Last week, Adidas shared a trailer for the collaboration featuring empowering voiceovers and Beyonce herself wearing the merch. Now, this isn't the first time the Legally Blonde actress has received a gift from Beyonce. Following the Golden Globes, Jay-Z and Beyonce sent her a bottle of champagne. So they are big Reese fans. Now, Reese isn't the only celebrity to receive a surprise orange box from Beyonce. Ellen DeGeneres, Yara Shahidi, and Bay's own mother, Tina Knowles Lawson, also shared videos of themselves unboxing the fashion-filled package. Beyonce first announced that she'd collaborate with Adidas last April. At the time, she expressed her excitement over the new deal, calling it the partnership of a life. Time. I'm sure our orange box is just downstairs <laughs> waiting to be brought we'll go up. Check it. I'm gonna email them. Yeah, up. I think it might take a couple people. We'll make it happen. All right, Rachel Ray is serving us a delicious new magazine. People's parent company Meredith has updated and redesigned the chef and talk show host magazine with a new name, Rachel Ray in Season. The new quarterly issue boasts an upgraded paper stock, bolder photography, and new editorial sections and insider contributors. Rachel shares with us, quote, this new format delivers richer, more seasonal, more of the moment content that's personal in every way. It's designed to be more of a keepsake and a collector's item. Now, some things you'll see in the winter spring 2020 issue of Rachel Ray in season is Rachel's Sunday dinner. It's for when you have more than 30 minutes to spend in the kitchen. These recipes will inspire you to gather those you love, get comfortable and comfort one another. There's the three minute meal. So each month she shares a technique that you can master to whip up all kinds of quick and delicious dinners for your family. I like the three minutes, right? Not a lot of time. <laughs> What's fresh? It's a column dedicated to easy weeknight cooking ideas that pack in the season's best ingredients. Editor-in-Chief Lauren Iannotti told Meredith in part, in Rachel Ray in season, we're boiling it down to the true must-makes and giving our readers an experience they'll want to stretch out and spend time with rather than race through. Rachel Ray in season is available now. And those are your Star Tracks for today. All right, stay with us. We are talking Roswell, Area 51, and UFO sightings with Aidan Gillen and Neil McDonough. They join us live ahead of Project Blue Book season two premiere. Plus, Tatum O'Neill is bearing her scars and sharing her story about living with rheumatoid arthritis. Really brave of her. Stick around for that. All right, everyone, let's talk celeb relationships. 
It's our new segment here at People Now, now called Heart Monitor. Here we go. Oprah Winfrey says she and her longtime love, Stedman Graham, have a spiritual partnership. Oprah opening up about their unwavering relationship in her magazine, O, oh, the Oprah magazine, explaining in an essay that she had, that she and Stedman had gotten, had they gotten married, they quote, would not still be together. Winfrey shared that she once believed she did want to get married, but when Graham proposed in 1993, after the two had been dating since 1986, she quickly realized, quote, my life with the show was my priority and we both knew it. She recalled simply wanting to be asked for her hand in marriage rather than really going through with it. Oprah explaining, I realized I didn't actually want a marriage. I wanted to be asked. I wanted to know that he felt I was worthy of being his missus, but I didn't want the sacrifices, the compromises, the day in, day out commitment required to make a marriage work. As for how they've made it work all of these years, Winfrey said it's because, quote, he created an identity beyond being Oprah's man and because we share all the values that matter. Winfrey went on to reveal that she defines her relationship as a spiritual partnership, a phrase coined by author Gary Zukav, who was a frequent guest on the Oprah Winfrey show. Andrea. All right, on to a relationship that's not going as well here. <laughs> Teresa Giudice is complaining about her daughters. On Wednesday's Real Housewives of New Jersey, she revealed that they often take their father's side in arguments between her and her husband, Joe Giudice. So Joe was calling to wish Teresa a happy Mother's Day, but instead began bickering with her over a previous necklace he had given her with her name on it. Now, according to Joe, the piece of jewelry was similar to the silver one that Teresa's daughters had just gifted her for Mother's Day. The problem was Teresa never remembered getting Joe's gift and argued with him. Joe said, quote, you don't remember anything. I bought you a lot of things. My wife's brain is going mush. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's harsh. Melania told her mom, you don't remember anything, so you don't. You have such a bad memory. Teresa told the audience that Melania taking sides hurt her tremendously. People announced exclusively in December that Teresa and Joe had agreed to separate after 20 years of marriage. A source told people the pair aren't divorcing just yet and are instead remaining focused on their children during their time apart. And that's your Heart Monitor update for today. All right, Tatum O'Neill is burying her scars. The actress got candid about her battle with rheumatoid arthritis on Instagram on Wednesday, sharing a photo of her bruised and scarred back to show the effects of living with the autoimmune disease. She pointed out each scar in the caption, writing, quote, living with rheumatoid arthritis, a fall scratch scar on my right hip and the back surgery scar from eight years ago. My last back surgery scar is on the front from February. Although her bruises may look severe, Tatum assured her followers that believe it or not, she says, this is me actually getting better. Tatum previously touched on her battle with rheumatoid arthritis on Sunday, posting a black and white photo of herself sitting beside her dog on Instagram, telling her fans she's on the mend. According to the Mayo Clinic, rheumatoid arthritis, also known as RA, is a chronic inflammatory disorder that occurs when the immune system mistakenly attacks the body's issues. The condition can cause inflammation, swelling, and pain throughout the body that may lead to bone erosion and joint deformity. In an Instagram post shared in December, Tatum posted a picture of herself and her prescription medications packaging, revealing she's been seeking medical treatment for her arthritis. The actress also revealed in March of 2019 that she had undergone spinal surgery. She updated her fans via Instagram, letting them know that she made it. Uh, Tatum is fighting through this illness, using her platform to bring awareness. We wish her all the best. All right, now moving on to this. Kristen Cavallari stopped by People Now to talk about the third season of Very Cavallari. It was with me and our guest co-host, Danya. We covered everything in our chat. Take a look. It was stressful at first. It really was just keeping up with it. I don't, we, none of us were prepared and I've been learning as, as I go and I didn't have the right players within my company to keep up with it. But I do feel like now we're at a great place. I have amazing, an amazing team and um, we're, we're ready for everything that's coming our way, hopefully. What are some of the challenges that you faced back then that you might look at now and feel like it's not that big of a deal? Well, um, you know, it's all growing pains within a company. I don't know if it wasn't really a big deal, but at one point I just needed bodies. I just needed people in there helping, helping me you know, yeah. and there's been quite a bit of turnover and I was down on myself for a while, but the more CEOs and founders that I talk to, everyone says that they've gone through the same things. It's just part of a company. I mean, we've only been around for two and a half years. We're still a, essentially a startup. And so we're, we're figuring it out, but I do feel like now everyone is here for the right reasons and everyone's making a career out of working at Uncommon James, which is awesome. Yeah. And the start of the season is emotional, but in a heartbreaking way, it's the fallout that I have with a girlfriend. And so this season really kind of has everything. Um, you also get to see the opening of my second store in Chicago. Again, emotional for very different reasons. And so it's just kind of a wild ride this season, but yeah. it's, it's good. It, I mean, I don't know. You've been into people now a lot over the past couple, yeah. two, three years. It feels like you um, are in a really good place with 
putting yourself out there, even when it comes to those serious emotional things and kind of helping, I, I, I don't know, fans are on board with you. Does it feel therapeutic for you to do that? So it's so funny, someone else asked me this morning, no, it doesn't, it's <laughs> actually, the hard part about it is, is having to go and, and talk about it multiple times. So not even just in interviews, right. but with the show, you know, for, for the interviews that you do on the show, you do those months after something has happened and you have to pretend, not pretend, but yeah, be you in the Yeah, you kind of get back there in the headspace, right? Exactly, yeah. and talk about it as though it's, it's currently happening. And that I found, especially with my situation with my friend Kelly, it was so hard. I really felt like I was going through it again. And so I, I, I guess maybe in a sense that is therapeutic. Maybe it's because I have to talk about it so much and work through it so many times that I can really sit here now and be like, I'm actually in an okay place about it. Um, but it is definitely very tough to have to relive those emotions. When it comes to family life, work life balance, when the cameras aren't rolling and business mode isn't on, yeah. what does just casual family day look like? Yeah, um, that's every single weekend for us yeah. for the most part. But we, you know, we like to do an activity with our kids at least one a day just to get out of the house. We have three yeah. kids and I feel like if we stay in the house all, or you know, or just at home, everyone's fighting, crazy. it's a yeah. disaster. Yeah. So we like to take them to breakfast. We like to go to the park. We like to go paint pottery. We've been doing a lot of lately. You know, I mean, very normal stuff. We're a very normal family. I'm cooking almost every single meal. My kids love to help me cook. They love being in the kitchen. So I mean, I, I think people would be surprised. We're extremely normal. We're yeah. doing what everybody else is doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you still keep up with anyone from the Hills? I do. I talk to Audrina and Heidi all the time. Brody I've kept in touch with. Uh, Steven, from Laguna Beach and both Alex is from Laguna Beach too. So yeah, I definitely still talk to a lot of people. What do you, last question about it. What do you miss most about Laguna Beach life? Um, like the show or just living there in Yeah, general? whatever you say, whatever comes to mind. Well, the, I loved living in Laguna because it's a beach community, you yeah. know? So it was like you never wore shoes or if you did, it was only flip flops. And just that laid back, cool vibe, it was, it was awesome. All right, Very Cavalieri airs Thursday nights on E, so check it out if you haven't already. All right, now watch this. I want Project Blue Book to formally close the Roswell incident. Closing Roswell means reopening it. You put Blue Book in that position and they fail, those guys won't be the only ones to lose their jobs. Are you ready to face that? Yeah. Generals. Sir, you wanted to see us. We're going on a little field trip. Uh, where? New Mexico. I'll brief you in the air. Yes, sir. Season two of history's hit drama, Project Blue Book, is about to premiere. The show is based on true events, which has Dr. Alan Hynek digging into the truth behind UFO sightings, all while working for the government, who may be trying to cover them up. We are here with stars Neil McDonough and Aidan Gillen. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks Thank for having us. I, I will admit this, we were just saying right before that, Neil, you'd done some comedy stuff in the past, and now watching that clip, it just it puts it in a whole new light to imagine it as you as like this comedic guy. Well, I was saying, you know, I moved to LA to become a comedian. Yeah. And immediately they said, well, you don't really look funny. How about army guys? And, <laughs> and that's really and, taken and, off. And, 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 it's, it's, and it's worked. So now I get to yeah. play my dad on television every week who's, who's in the Air Force himself. So. so in Project Blue Book season two, we get to learn more about your characters. At least that's what we've heard. What can you tease that's coming up? Uh, in terms tease, of tease, what tease, you can tease, learn. Tease, 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 tease. <laughs> in terms of what you can learn about our characters and, or in terms of just generally yeah, what's Yeah, like what, what are you excited um, for people to learn about your character? I'm well, I, I don't always like to give the game away, so mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I'm more of a kind of guy who likes to withhold things mm -hmm. than present uh, too much more. I'd like to add colors, uh, hopefully subtly. You know, I think coming back to a second season, the writers kind of know the people that they're writing for and the actors know their characters more and the actors know the other actors more, so you know, it's just easier to uh, you know, right to us. Right yeah. To us. yeah. Well, well, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just a short hand has developed, not just between the, between the actors, but between, between the, you know, writers and the yeah. actors, and therefore between the actors and the audience. Hopefully, I would hope for just more silent moments, more moments of reflection. We've done a lot of, you know, setup on who these people are and, you know, a lot of plot based stuff. And even if it's just five seconds here or there to just yeah. see people, you know, Think. thinking, because a lot of it's about plot and moving things forward and you can't, you know, it's just, it's, it can be a bit intense watching that all the time. Sure. And uh, just w working with this mostly the same cast and crew and uh, you know producers for the second time around, you can only y y you know you can only improve. Yeah. yeah. And season two is diving right into Roswell and Area 51. How exciting was it to get into these more well-known cases, or did that add a lot more pressure? Well, it added pressure for my character Harding, where the, the, the first season was phenomenal. I mean, project it was great. The, the ratings were massive. Everyone loved the show, but my character and uh, and Michael Harney's character, we were kind of like 
the two old Muppet guys just barking orders the whole time. <laughs> Where this season, they really delve into the characters. You know, for, for my character, bringing in Catholicism, which I'm a devout Catholic, bringing in boxing, which I used to be a boxer, bringing in all these things that are, that, you know, kneeled up the character a bit or aided up the character a little bit. So um, they can do that because it's the second season and they can they can just kind of flex their muscles a bit and try new things and flesh it out more. Yeah, and know that we're going to be around for a while because we're going to be around yeah, for a while. What are your thoughts on all the news that Area 51 made last year where people did a raid? There were a couple people Storm arrested. Me. I offered to go down there and said, I'll go down <laughs> yeah. there. I'll be down there. You know, you know. There's that big and Facebook like, no, 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 page. No, no, no. <laughs> it's because it was interesting when they, when they said, you know, you, can, you guys can come in, but if you cross this line, we can shoot you. Yeah, right. You know, so there's definitely something there that, that, that you know, there's something, I'm not sure if they're hiding or what the case is, but the great thing about our show is we open up the blue books and we open up, you know, these files and talk about them on national television. Right. It's pretty awesome. You definitely you know, think there's something there. What do you think? Well, ultimately, not that many people showed up, right? I think I mean, 200, though. I know, but 2 million signed. Signed up, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which means but that, I think you know, there's, there's good. like, you know, at least 20 or, you know, 100 million people who know about it, who have an interest. Right, and, yeah. uh you know, it's and something that is not too Blue far yeah. from the uh, public imagination. It's not. Yeah, and if it's you know, like if you couldn't show up there, um, next best thing, check out this no, show. No, it's great and promo for the show. We'll yeah. still be doing it. And whether there's you know anything's happening in there that's you know covert or not, and you know there probably is, but you know, uh, you know, militarily or whatever. Uh, it's nice to think that there's, you know, mystery out there. Yeah. Well, so that's the question. The whole belief in UFOs and the idea that, that there are these things that exist that the government's aware of. I don't know what your theories were going into this, but now having experienced the show and learned more about specific cases like this, has it changed your opinion? Well, I was, I was completely, meh, no, no. But now that I've done the show and, and have read some of the things, it, it, makes me, it, it makes me pause. It makes me think, what else is out there? Is there mm -hmm. something out there? And, that alone, it's, it's fun to have a discussion. Like I said, my wife Ravey and our five kids can sit around the television and watch a show. How many shows can we actually do that nowadays, mm -hmm. A? But B, to really discuss what is out there, what's life about, who, when did time begin, where, is the, where does the universe end, who created all of this? And those are great questions and, and, and great topics for conversation, especially with kids. It's, a, it's For me, Pretty interesting. I, I love that it's kind of a family-ish show, in yeah. our house anyway. I'm sorry, and the conclusion of uh, Heineck, uh, Alan Heineck, who the, the man I play, you know, uh, of his life's work was, you know, would give you uh, food for thought, you know what I mean? That uh, this is a very, very smart uh, guy who, you know, um, after studying this, you know, field for 30 years, 40 years, going in as a skeptic, um, you know, wound up quite open minded about it. He never had the empirical proof, but he was... Changed his opinion, yeah. you know, his well, feeling. Somewhat. Yeah. How, I mean. how about conspiracy theories in general? Do you look more closely at things that are happening in terms that the government's involved in? Do you look at any of that stuff differently now as news items kind of trickle across the screen? <laughs> I feel <Big> like... <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. You, you, you know, you look at things a little differently now. Um, certainly in the last several years with, with all the, the political landscape, you question a lot of, of different things about what's going on in the media and such. But uh, for me, that, that's here nor there. I love being part of Project Blue Book. I love being able to, to jump into this character, Harding, and, and really flesh out who he is. Mm -hmm. and, you know, to be able to work with Aiden and to work with you know Malarkey and and, and, and you know everyone on the show, it's and it's it's been it's been really a blessing. Yeah, and Project Blue Book lasted for 17 years. So, is there going to be 17 seasons? That's what is I just that, said. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Is, you think that's actual possibility? Why wouldn't it be? There's so many <laughs> stories you can go on forever. So hopefully it'll be around for for quite some time. But you know the audience really you know they're gravitating to the show and, and it's. Uh, it's it's really been a fantastic run so far. Yeah. yeah, and you both have played villains before. Who enjoys it more of the two of you? I don't know. We've never discussed. Well, that's pretty good. We've never discussed. Well, it. I don't know. You you do a very good villain. Um, <laughs> yeah, I enjoy it. But yeah. But we like to you know I love to infuse my comedy into my villain. So. Um, well, you know, joking aside. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's my biggest joke of the day. Um, Comedy, everyone's into the heavies. He as Harding in Blue Book, it's not just cold steeliness. You know, there's a lot of mischief in that character, and I did notice that this time around, um, specifically. And maybe that's just another one of the shades that uh, Neil is in there. throwing in this year to kneel it up. As yeah. Said, okay. But. Yeah. I like that. All right, let's talk about this quickly. Speaking of villains, Aiden, everyone loves you as little finger on uh, Game of Thrones, little little show that you did. <laughs> little show. Yeah. Looking back, <laughs> what what would you say is your fondest memory from that experience? Maybe something that would excite fans that are still kind of, you know, in that zone and loving it. Fondest memory, it would be quite left field, you right. know, and probably not something that fans would respond to at all. Oh no. So I could make one up if you like. 
No, I How mean, the left field I, honestly, I mean, my favorite, the, when I look back on that, there was a moment, it was just before we started, when I was up in Belfast, where a lot of it was shot in Northern Ireland, and um, I was there doing something else at a film festival, and I was in a hotel room looking out over the city, you know, the grey skies and all that, at like six o'clock in the morning, thinking, this thing is starting, I have a feeling that it's going to be big, and that it's going to be, you know, the, you know, the most exciting ride of my life, and um, look at, looking back on it, it was, it was that moment. And then there's, there's various things, shooting here and there, um, you know, standing out in snowy uh, courtyards, you know, in castles in Northern Ireland or... That's awesome. That's, yeah, yeah, I it know. Really is. Like, what a dream. You know, with, with, with great scripts, yeah. great directors, great actors, and it's always good for actors to... You can't, you're only as good as the people you work with, so, which is why it's great working on... Uh, this show as well, because people work hard on it, they really do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have another movie coming up, Those Who Wish Me Dead, Angelina Jolie, Tyler Perry, Nicholas Holt, great cast. Yeah. What can you tease about that, because people um, are really excited. Not too much, I mean, it's been directed by um, by Taylor uh, Sheridan, right? Who you've been working with. The Yellowstone, that's right. Um, who's a, you know, a real awesome. amazing new face. You know, he uh, made a film called Wind River, and he also, uh, he, uh, wrote the script for Hella or High Water and you know he's a director, writer, director who's got a very old school sensibility about him you know like in common with some directors that you know I really like you know of, of mm -hmm. old like John Huston and stuff like that. It's a pursuit thriller set in the wilderness um, you know if I had to think of what, what way you would categorize it you know it, the script reminded me of films like Deliverance or oh, wow, know, okay. that kind of thing and um, yeah, he's well, such a talent. Yeah, really you know, it's, it's a it's a thriller, a pursuit thriller. And I love hearing I love hearing your perspective of what makes it appealing to you. It's time for a little game. Are you ready for this? We're gonna play a round no. of <laughs> People Now Confess Sesh. It's fairly easy. Um, is it easy? Is it easy to do if you don't have your glasses it's on? Easy it's to, well, easy. well, maybe maybe not. He can help. Maybe. Uh, we're just gonna turns, just pull out a question. It's gonna make me look like a read like it a and away pensioner. We go. <laughs> no. Right. I was gonna say it's upside down. Mr. McDonough. There you go. Let's see here. Besides Project Blue Book, what is your favorite project you've ever worked on and why? Ooh. Uh, it has to be an acting project, does it? <laughs> <laughs> it can be whatever, I guess. A film that nobody will know. Uh, it's not, always those not, ones. Not many people will know, called Mojo, uh, made in the late 90s, set in the late 50s, um, written and directed by uh, Jez Butterworth, who went, went on to become a playwright of much international renown and multiple Tony winner. This play, uh, The Ferryman, is probably still on Broadway at the moment. Wow, yeah. very, very cool. exciting time. Yeah, yeah. what about you? And character, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, fu it's funny, I had so much fun doing this film for um, this network called INSP, and we just did this uh, Western called The Warrant, which comes out next month. And it was, it was so great to play the good guy, but to, to, to be a lead in, in, in a Western, which I'd never really done before. Riding horses? It was so yeah. awesome. You know, it was <laughs> post-Civil War, and uh, my nephew was in it, my nephew Michael McDonough, McDiesel. <laughs> <laughs> he was in there for his first, first uh, role in a movie, so it was, it was, I really enjoyed What's it. What's the name again? The Warrant. All okay, right, we'll we have time for one more. Um, Would you do the honors, Neil? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that looked like a good one. <laughs> <laughs> The celebrity I'd love to collaborate with on a project is hmm. Paula Abdul. I knew it! Oh, I, wait, I wait. knew it! I could have bet money. How did you know? Because she was in the photo booth for like ten hours the other day, I guess, for for her thing. And I, we were making jokes back there. Oh, uh, funny! Big Paula Abdul nice fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the project's going to be, but can you start oh, working? Can you? I'm Neil's going to start right now because if he's, you know, if he's that yeah, tuned in, three. yeah, you know, he's, he knows what's going on. All That's right, right. Neil, what do you, what do you got? Favorite celebrity or actor? Yeah. yeah. Well, favorite actor I would have worked with would, would have been Gene Hackman. Um, you know, French Connection was always my favorite film. Popeye Doyle was such a great thing, and, and Gene Hackman is just, you know, he, he's incredible. So I'm going with Gene Hackman. Great stuff. It's All great right. to talk to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here, Aiden and Neil. Uh, and uh, everyone, make sure to watch them when season two of Project Blue Book premieres Tuesday, January 21st at 10 p.m. Eastern on History. Olympic diving legend Greg Louganis is opening up in this week's issue of People about pushing through rough times and fitting back into that Speedo at almost 60 years old. After trying on his original Speedo, Greg was determined to recreate that iconic poster photo from 1989. And while our throwback photo isn't the exact poster image, he looks almost the same as he did back then. He looks great. Yeah, really staying fit, staying in shape. Yeah, Greg became the first male diver to win gold in both the springboard and the platform events in the 1984 and 88 Olympics. He became one of the first high-profile athletes to come out as gay 
in 1994, just six years after being diagnosed with HIV. Now, he almost died from a fungal infection in the early 1990s. Greg's latest challenge has been with depression, which he says doctors have linked to head injuries that he sustained while diving. He says, I've suffered from depression erratically for years, but now it's been kind of a persistent thing. I've always been able to pull myself up and out of it, but lately it seems so much more difficult. It turns out he's working with specialists on treatments to combat that condition. Yeah, but that isn't stopping this iconic athlete from looking forward to the future. In fact, he tells people that whenever he hears someone describe him as the greatest male diver of all time, he thinks, okay, but now what are you going to do with your life? The future is still being written for Greg. In 2013, he got married, and he and his husband recently moved to a new home in Los Angeles. He's also swapped his passion for diving with training dogs and their handlers for agility competitions, and has even won a number of national championships with his Parson Russell Terriers, and their names are Nipper and Dobby. <laughs> I love that. He insists that dogs have gotten him through some of his toughest times. For more of Greg Louganis' story, pick up a copy of People on Newsstands Friday. In this People exclusive, we're learning the story of inseparable identical twins, Michelle Lauren Anderson and Katherine Anderson Hill. As babies, the girls were different, but loved doing everything together, according to their mom, Linda. But that changed on May 19, 1996, when the twins were just two years old. They were visiting their father in Fridley, Minnesota, when a fire broke out in their bedroom around midnight. Catherine escaped with minor injuries, but Michelle's bed caught fire. Michelle telling us, quote, I remember seeing the flames coming up on me. Her father managed to pull her out, but 90% of her body was badly burned. Wow, an investigation suggested the cause of the fire was a wayward cigarette, but it was never officially confirmed. The twins have not had contact with their father since. In the 24 years since that night, Michelle and Catherine, now 26 years old, have forged an even stronger connection with each other. It's one that has grown through a lifetime of physical and emotional challenges. Michelle has fought to overcome physical challenges from her injuries. She's had 80 surgeries so far. And Catherine has had to overcome her own remorse and frustration telling people, quote, there were times when I felt a lot of guilt seeing my sister in pain and knowing there was nothing I could do, but we're as close as sisters can be. For Michelle, Catherine has been a constant support system, but it hasn't been easy. She explains, quote, having someone who looks exactly like you but doesn't have scars, it's always a reminder of what my life would have been. She's the life and the face I could have had. I was so heartbreaking to hear. By the time the twins turned 14, tensions between the two surfaced. Catherine struggled to balance her interests, including synchronized swimming and playing the cello, with being there for her sister. Michelle was struggling with the constant painful surgeries, maintaining her grades and matching her sister's pace. She says that she wanted to do everything, but her body, it just wouldn't keep up. Michelle discovered her passion for horseback riding at a camp for burn survivors in Colorado. She went on to become an equestrian competitor, and now gives therapeutic riding lessons near her home in St. Paul. She credits finding their own identities as the thing that saved their friendship as twins. Since then, the sisters' differences have only brought them closer. They talk every day on the phone. Catherine says, quote, I don't know what I would do without her. She's much more than just my twin. Michelle still copes with physical issues, including pain and extreme sensitivity in her hands and her feet, but she's focused on finishing her second master's degree in business leadership this June. Such a remarkable story. Heartbreaking yeah. story, but a story of overcoming and, and just really pushing through. Mm -hmm. We wish them all the best. All right, we're taking a look. One last look at our question of the day. We want to know what you think is the most important aspect of a relationship. I'm curious. So here we go. Spiritual trust. connection, trust, yeah. physical attraction, sense of humor. I almost feel like if like spiritual connection is kind of vague, but like Oprah said it in the quote that they had the same values. And don't you think like for yeah. longevity, trust, and like sharing the same values and worldview, it almost kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, right? I mean, all of those things. You, you need all of them. If you had to put them in order, so uh, well, I'm talking in order of like how it would develop. So attraction oh, okay. it, and humor. It. Yeah. And then worldview, spiritual connection, and then, and then trust. trust. Right. Or well, you could trust someone right off the bat. Just if right you're off. on the same page. I don't know. If you're on the same page, yeah. All right. There you go. There you go. We'll be asking you a new question of the day tomorrow on People Now, so tune in for that. Coming up tomorrow as well, former star of Andy Mack, Asher Angel, joins us live to talk about his brand new music. Plus, Willa Fitzgerald and author Megan Abbott are spilling all the details on USA Network's new series, Dare Me. Thanks for watching. For now, we leave you with one last thing from the new cast of Party of Five. Bye. Guys. Bye. Hi, we're the cast of Party of Five, and, and this, this is, is one, one last thing. thing. Last time I laughed out loud was two seconds ago. Yeah, literally. <laughs> With all of them. <laughs> yes. Last show I binge watched was The Mandalorian. Look outside. They're waiting for you. How to get away with murder. The guilt and the shame. And it's no way to live. We could have buried it. My last moment of bliss, I honestly think it was just not too long ago now when we were all standing in Times Square yes. and our 
faces were everywhere. I know. What the heck? And I had my mom beside me. Like what? My last big splurge was on a top coat that I needed because I was freezing in New York City. Mine Ooh. is sweatpants and sweatshirts. Food I spend yeah. too much. Of course. Yeah, I guess. Oh, of course. She's like, oh hey guys, you wanna come eat a vegan waffle with me? <laughs> She's just putting us all on blast. Vegan waffle?